Genesis, first book, chapter 1, 24 through 31, we're at day 6. I want you to watch, I want you to watch this when you read this now. For God said. I want you to pay attention to that. God said. You look for patterns of writers. Moses is a guy who establishes patterns when he writes. Kind of, kind of, he does in Hebrew what Paul used to do, what Paul did in Greek. And so once you become familiar with the writer, and he establishes it right off the bat in chapter 1, Moses establishes a pattern of teaching. For example, he starts with creation. He gives you six days of creation and then one day of rest, making our seven days. But here's what he did. Every day he established a pattern in creation of the first six days where creation actually occurred. He established the pattern of God said. Every, every time, every day begins with God said, and then something wonderfully new is produced. Agreed? Well, I don't know. If you study it, you'll see it. God said, and, and God said, let there be light, and there was... Nah. And that's going to occur every day of the six days of creation. But here's what the casual reader misses. He misses that on two of the six days, he said that more than once. The pattern is when he says God said, he creates something wonderfully new. Agreed with that? Well, you know, day one, let there be light, there was, and so it goes. The seven days is a pattern of your week. Would you agree with that? There are seven days in a week. <laughs> I mean, you knew that if you didn't go to church, didn't you? You may have not know where the seven days come from unless you went to church. How about that? Where do you think seven days come? We call it a week, right? We call it a week and a weekend. <laughs> where do you think that whole idea came from? It came from the Bible came from the Bible, came from the first book, first chapter in the Bible. Here's what you might miss, though. When you count the days, day one, two, three, four, five, we call it, Monday, we call it Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. He called it day one, day two, day three, agreed? We call it Monday, we call it the first day of the week is Sunday, agreed? Well, it is. I mean, I wasn't looking for consent on this idea. First day of the week is Sunday. You know how many people don't believe that? Because they get a weekend. They, the first, they think the first day of the week is Monday. Isn't that interesting? Because they have a weekend. If you didn't have a weekend, you wouldn't. So when you read the creation story... Have a calendar next to you, <laughs> because on the first day, that's Sunday. And on Sunday, God is going to do, God said he's going to do some, something wonderfully new for your life. Do you understand that principle? Well, let's say Monday, God said, and he's going to produce something wonderful. You need to begin your Every day, you should start your day the way God wants you to live it, and that's with something new and wonderful in it. That's the principle behind the creation story for you. That's why he said day one, God spoke into something wonderfully new for the human race. The whole creation story is for you and for me. The first days... The first three days, there was no solar system. The last three days, there were. Why did God even go through this exercise? Because in the Genesis 1-2, the earth was not inhabitable. 
Isaiah 45, 18. So God restored the creation of Genesis 1, 1 so that the earth be, could, could become inhabitable. The earth does not become inhabitable until the fourth day in the solar system. Now you got four, five, and six, and the earth is not only ready, but is inhabited. See, you really need to know that stuff. I mean, you've heard the creation story many times, but you've never studied it, baby. Now, on day three, God said something twice. On day three, it says God said, and he produced something new. On day three, he spoke, he said, and he produced something. On day three, you have two works. Well, it's in your Bible. It's in your Bible. Now watch, we're at day six. And we see a pattern now. God said, and he produced something wonderfully new for the habitation of mankind. Do you understand that principle? See, I'm in, I guess I'm probably in, I'm in day six now. I'm probably in my 16th lesson. Somewhere around that number. On the creation story to build you into the principle that we are. But I haven't just started this. This is not the first sermon on this. So here we are, verse 24. So I want you to pay attention. He, it's going to say four times. It's going to four times. It's going to say God said. How many times? Four. <laughs> Thank you. Well, somebody's listening. Thank you. Now watch it. And, and listen, every time he says it, what's he going to do? Create. Create. What? Something new and wonderfully for the habitation of man. Agreed? Okay. So pay attention when we read through this, and then we're going to have a word of prayer and we'll get into our study. See, that was a review. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures, haya nephish. After their kind, that's the Hebrew word men, meaning species, cattle, creeping things, beasts of the earth, after their kind, species. And it was so, I can't go back and explain that, but that it was so, it was so, takes you all the way back to the eternal life conference in eternity past. If you say, where in the world would you find that? If you're interested, you could go to Ephesians 1.4 later. Because there's a phrase that Paul used before. He talks about things that is coming to pass that had been prepared before the foundation of the world. You know where the foundation of the world is in the book of Genesis chapter 1. It's the story of creation. And it was so. You're going to find that several times. And it was so, it, and it means this, and it was decreed. It was decreed in eternity past, and it came to pass in the present time. It was so. <laughs> I mean, wh wh where does he get that idea? Eternal, eternity past. At the Eternal Life Conference. We've studied that. Verse 26, then God said, let us make man. Now, now he's, got to, he's going to do something different. How do I know that? Now he's going, to, he's going to do something new, wonderful for us. How do I know that? Because it says God said. Right? So something new and wonderful for man is going to come into existence. Agreed? Okay. Then God said, let us make man... In our image, according to our likeness, Salim Demuth. In the Hebrew, that's called Salim Demuth. And that's what separates man from animal. Watch this now. What, what, when he was doing the animals, in, like in verse 24, 25, the cattle, the creeping things, the beast of the earth, everything that creeps on the ground after kind, God saw that was good. 
they were all created after their what? After their kind. Do you see that? It, are we, are we, we got the same book? Okay. <laughs> I'm wondering if we're in a different chapter or a different book or something. See, after their kind is the Hebrew word men, and it means species, a DNA of species, a cattle DNA, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. that's in the Hebrew, that's really important. It's M I N, it's called men, M I N, and it refers to species of animals that were created on day five and six. They have Haya Nefesh life, but they're created after their kind. Are you with me? Birds are going to be birds and fish are going to be fish and cows are going to be cows and sheep are going to be sheep and dogs are going to be dogs and cats are going to be cats and, and it's going to remain that way. All right, now watch in verse 26. He said, let us make mankind in our image according to our likeness. Who is he talking to? Let us. Who is he talking to? There ain't nobody there. Who's thinking? He's talking to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit called the Trinity or the Godhead. Ain't nobody else there yet. Okay. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, Salim Demuth. And let them, see, let us and let them, we know the difference between that, don't we? Let us, let them, and let them, what's he referring to? Mankind, right? Look, let us make man, let them, mankind, see, we went from a singular idea to a plural, let them rule, rule over the fish of the sea. You fishermen like that, don't you? Huh? I got a grandson that does. He loves this whole idea. That's why he takes, he goes out after fish because he thinks he can rule them. He thinks he can outsmart a fish. Most of the time he can. Rule over, let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, the cattle over the earth, over every living creepy, creeping things that creep. Now, isn't that good that we know we can rule over them because your wife wants to make sure you get take care of those bo boogers right there, right? You get a few of those in the house and she ain't going in. <laughs> God created man. We're back to that. God created man. That's Bara. That's the word Bara in the Hebrew. Listen, Bara in the Hebrew means to create something out of nothing. Bara, B-A-R-A, the word translated in English, create, means to create something out of nothing. Asa, A-S-A-H, means to make something out of something. You get a piece of wood and a person with good skills can make something. You go, like, how'd you do that? I have the piece of wood. He said, because I'm an artist. Yeah, you can make something out of something. That's asa in the Hebrew. But when you have the word in the English, create, like we do here, it's the word barat. It means to create something out of nothing. Only God can do that. It comes out of his own existence. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Watch out now, because I'm going to get politically correct on this. <laughs> Not incorrect. Male and female, he created them. Who would have ever thought in my lifetime that I have to explain that to anybody? My, my, my. Somebody going on the Supreme Court of the United States of America to defend our Constitution that cannot define a woman. I could bring a three-year-old with a cat in and could do it. 
She'd pop that cat over and tell you exactly what that cat was. If she would have lived on a farm like I did, she could. I don't know about the city girls. God blessed them and said to them, there it is again, God said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and rule. See, we got another word in there. We can, we can, we can subdue as well as rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, every living thing that moves on the earth. Fourth time God said, the fourth time God said, all four times on day six, four times on day six, that's a heavy day, isn't it? No wonder he rested on the seventh. Every one of these words are an imperative in the Hebrew language. That's a command. It's a command in the DNA. It's a command in the DNA of mankind. Be fruitful. Here's what it says. It says to be fruitful. And I lost one place. Be fruitful, multiply, fill, subdue, and rule are all imperatives. It's part of the DNA of the Salim Demuth of the human race. The human race is made in the image according to the likeness of God. Salim Demuth. Not after a species. We're not, we weren't created to be a species. We were created to be the image and likeness of God Almighty. And part of the DNA package of man, just like there's a DNA package in animals called species, there is in mankind a DNA factor called Salim de Muth. In the image according to the likeness. And in that DNA package of the human race are five imperatives, commands. Be fruitful, multiply, fill, subdue, and rule over the creation of day five and six. Then God said, fourth time, behold, Something new. Watch this now. See that word behold? We've never seen that before. We have never seen the word behold before. In the entire creation story, we have not seen that. We're going to see it twice. And it's a big deal. Pray? Not yet. I'm just reading the passage. Give me a minute. I know you think I'm preaching, but I'm not. I'm just reading it. Behold, Horton's ready to get into the thing, isn't he? <laughs> Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth, every tree which has fruit bearing seed, it shall be for what? What? Food. Food. Doesn't come from the government comes from God. And God established this whole earth and put all kinds of food on it for your good and for mine. Day six. You know what we call that in theology? Where God provides for your needs, for your daily existence. We call that logistical grace. We call it logistical grace. Turn your Bibles to Matthew 6, and I'm going to have a word of prayer on. I'm going to show you something. Just turn to Matthew 6 and hold it. I'm coming back to Genesis. It won't be hard to find. It's the first book. I'm going to come back to Genesis 6. Is it? I'm going to come back to Genesis 1. <clears throat> well, let's have a word of prayer. Yeah, Matthew, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we're, we're in the New Testament. <laughs> we're in the first First book of the new. Say first book of the old, first book of the new. Well, Father, we're so thankful today. Hey, let me let me make sure. 
guy got visitors. The moment you, because we live in the church age, the first coming of Christ, the moment you believe the gospel that he died on the cross for your sins, buried and raised from the dead, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Paul called that the gospel. When you believe it, that gospel is the power of God to save you. Romans 1, 16, the gospel is the power of God to save those who believe. When you believe that gospel, listen, if he, listen he's got to die on a cross for your sins. He's got to be raised from the dead to give you eternal life. He, he conquered sin and death. When you believe that, he's conquered both of them in your life. So that you could say with Paul to be absent from our bodies, to be present with the Lord. That's a wonderful idea. W what comforting words that is at funerals. <clears throat> so, you're, at the moment you believe the gospel, you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit indwells you to teach you and recall the word of God from your soul. We live in the church age. The third member of the Godhead lives inside your body. Did you know that? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? Don't you know that your body's become the temple of God? Because the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhead, dwells inside your body, and your body's no longer your own. It's been bought with Christ on the cross. And your body is not called a body anymore in the mind of God. You are the temple of God on earth. Did you know that? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. You do now. The Holy Spirit is there to teach and recall, John 14, 26, the Word of God from your soul. And that's what God wants you to do today. What He wants you to do is to look to the ministry of the Holy Spirit to teach you truth about this. Because day six is all about you and me. And what God has marvelously prepared for you and I in His grace program of logistical grace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God. We have done nothing but read the Word. What a marvelous thing it is. So enlightening and full of revelation to us. Sometimes we struggle about things there's no reason to struggle for because God has already taken care of them. When will we ever learn? that you are a magnificent God and you've prepared this entire earth for to be inhabited by all different types of animals and all mankind. And that you have provided everything necessary to take care of all of them in whatever crisis you prove to us in the day of Noah that you are still the God that takes care of the crisis situations of our life and will bring us to a new world. And I thank you for that. May we have the courage to believe by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's take a look at Matthew, the sixth chapter. See what he says about this thing about logistical grace that is brought up in our, our book here. Uh, I don't know if I put that on your paper or not, probably someplace. But I'm, I'm looking through here. I'm, I'm looking for the birds. 26. I'm in verse 26. Thank you. Watch this. Here's one thing you shouldn't have to ever get anxiety over. This is, here's one thing you should never have anxiety over. Are you with me? <laughs> You're right. Look at verse 25. For this reason I say to you, don't be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink or your body as to what you wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. See, we met them on day five. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, they, nor gather into barns, you know, taking care of tomorrow. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. You know that food that he's talking about? It's food for them too. 
Watch this now. Watch this question. Are you not worth much more than they? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think my dog probably is better than I am. My cat is better than I am. The alligator. I don't know. That's a fair question. Do you know the answer? Yes. Well, I know you do. <laughs> I know Horton does. Listen, listen to the answer, Salim Dumuth. You know what makes you worth more than the animals that are species? I don't care what they are called, cat, a bird, a dog, a pet pig. Who ever heard of a pet pig? I'm a farm boy. We were, the last thing we would have had is a pig in the house. Well, anyhow. Salim Demuth. You know why you're worth Christ? You know why you're worth God sending his only begotten son to a cruel cross to die a cruel death for you and for me? It's because he saw the worth of your soul. And do you know what the worth of your soul is? It's not the way you behave. It's who you are. And you are Salim Demuth. You are not like a dog. You're not like an alligator. You're not like a bear. You're not like a bird. You've been made in the image according to the likeness of God. You're a human being. We ought to have a healthy respect for all human beings. We care more about animals than we do people. I'm not opposed to that. I'm, I'm opposed to the idea that we don't understand a system of worth. Are you not worth more than the birds? Oh, I don't think so. I don't care. My goodness. You are because of Salim Demuth. You were made in the image according to the likeness of God. People tell you stuff that's not true. People tell you that you're not worth anything, that you're just a slug, that you will never be amount to anything. Why would you listen to that? None of that's true. If you're a human being, not a dog or a cat, a mouse or a creeping thing, you are worth God sending his only son to die on a cruel cross on your behalf. Why? He didn't do it for the dogs and the cats and the horses and the cows and all of that. He did it for mankind. Because of your worth. It's not how you've built your life. It's not who you are. It's, it's listen, it's who you are as a human being. Your worth is in your soul. Well, I hope you could get that. That would be wonderful. And then he goes on to talk about anxiety. <laughs> he said, you shouldn't be worried about this because God's got your back. Right? What was, it, what, was it, what was the deal? Food and feeding. That's God's specialty. How do I know it? Because that's what he told us in Genesis that we've already forgotten. In Genesis, the first chapter, on the sixth day, in Genesis, the first chapter, on the sixth day, He blessed them. He put five commands in their DNA. And then he said in verse 29, Behold, the first behold of two. Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth, every fruit tree bearing, bearing fruit seed. It shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth and every bird of the sky... He has put the DNA in them that he would feed them. To every, there's a promise to every burst, of, and he did that on day five. And to every beast of the earth and every bird of the sky and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, 
that's Haya Nefesh, I have given every green plant for food, and so it was. It was so. All right? And then God says, it's good. And then he said, it's very good. Okay? So let's look at a few things. Let's look at a few things for we, I, we get a cup of coffee and a donut or something. Okay? Listen to this. I'm on my paper now. You, I'm sure William gave you a paper, paper when you came in. And we're going to go look and just briefly... I wrote them down so you wouldn't miss four actions, four divine activities on day six on your benefit. Would you agree as to your benefit? God said, he said, here it is, and I'm doing this for mankind. Day six is all about mankind. It is about land animals, land animals, and mankind. But since I'm talking to a group of, of, of mankind and not animals, I'm going to focus on us. God said... And he, and he developed three categories of animals with Haya Nefesh, living souls. God made, God saw. In the second set, God said, let us, talking about the Godhead engaged in mankind, let us make mankind in our image, Salim de Muth, with God's DNA package under Salim de Muth, not under specie, and uh, let them... Uh, and let them rule over, let them rule over the three categories uh, of animals that he mentioned. And so then he goes on to talk about the word create. Now watch what he did. I'm, I'm in verse 26 through 28. I put this on your paper. He did, he did Ba-Ra three times. See the word create? Look here, verse Verse 26. Let's see, verse, verse 27. The word create, Bob Raj used three times in verse 27. God created man in his own image. That's Salim. In the image, Salim, of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So he used the word create. Now, what's the word create? That's Bob Ra three times. Dealing with mankind. Bara means to create something out of nothing, out of non-existing material. Now in the Hebrew, that's what that means, B-A-B-A-R-A. -A -A. All right? Then it says, it says three, three things about it. We'll, we'll come back and cover it. It says three things. It says, I'm going to create man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. When you have the first one, the first man here idea, it's the idea of mankind, that he created all of mankind the same way. In other words, every, every human being, every human being has the same five apparatuses of the soul. Self-consciousness, conscience, mentality, right? Right? Volition, free will, choice, and emotion. He made all of mankind that way. Everybody, everybody, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, everybody has a body, a soul, and a spirit. The soul of man is unique from the, from the soul of of the species, whether, whether it's a fish or a bird or a land animal or creepy things or whatever. Because we've been made in the image according to the likeness of God, and he used the word ba-ra. He created mankind. He created man. And he created male-female. And that's it. He created mankind. Everybody has the same soul characteristics. In other words, the primary characteristics of every human being's soul is that he has self-consciousness, awareness of, of himself and God in the world. He has mentality. He has a mind and a heart. The mind takes it in and the heart processes it and believes it. Right? He has emotions. He has free will. You do know you have free will, don't you? Well, why would you, have, why would you pay attention whether it's Monday or Tuesday? Who cares? You say, well, I got to go to work. Oh. 
Oh. Was that a choice you made? Yeah, where do you work? Was that a choice you made? Of course it was. Then he, he take, then it says he takes man. So he uses the man, word man twice in this verse. Here's mankind, and then here's man. He pulled him out separate with that, and he's talking about mankind, not man in the mankind of male and female. And the reason he did that in chapter 1 is to discuss it in chapter 2. Because what he's talking about, he's going to come back to the idea of, the, of subdue and rule. And he's going to talk about authority of leadership that's connected with God. All, all authority begins with God. Then it goes to his son. And then it goes to depending on what the divine institution is. If it's marriage, it goes to the husband. If they have children, it goes to the parents. If he's employed, it goes to the boss and the people who run the company, management, to the employee. And so it goes on. That's the second idea. And the reason that is there is because this man, individually, who's going to be called Adam, in chapter 2 is going to get married. And he's going to do it because he has discovered that all the animals had mates, and he didn't, and he felt left out or alone. And God says, well, okay, I will wait for you to come around that you thought you had a need for a mate. Right? Well, I know I'm ahead of the story, but I didn't, you know, I've... I've jumped ahead a little bit because God assigned him to name all the animals and he discovered as he was naming all the animals they were boys and girls. And so all of a sudden we have to come up with different names, right? If we're going to call her John, we got to call her Johnny or something. We can't. And so in chapter 2, verses 18 through 25, there's a marriage between a male and a female of the human race. We don't marry animals. You know, I'm, I'm talking about a horse or a cow or something. You say, well, I think I married one. Nah, I'm not talking about a human that's acting like one. Huh? So... So he created them. In the third set where he said, he used five imperatives. Be fruitful, procreate. Multiply, progeny. Fill the earth, population. Subdue, prevail, and rule, power. Authority, authority power. Authority over them. James, in the third chapter of James, 7 through 10, writes how writes this in the perspective history, and he says, man has subdued and tamed just about every animal that you can imagine. When I was a kid growing up, you went to the circus and saw it. I don't guess they have circuses anymore. I don't know. You know? You know what that was? They'd have an elephant, he'd come out, and go all kinds of stuff, and you'd go like, whoa. And then they'd bring a lion out, and he would do everything, and go, I hope he don't get loose. I didn't bring my shotgun in here. And so, But James says that mankind has been able to tame just about everything on day five and day six imaginable, except his tongue. <laughs> except his tongue. And has a man can, I mean, he's a Ferrari, you know, he can't control his tongue. 
Well, James was on to something, wasn't he? James was on to something. And of course, in the fourth, in the fourth time that God said, he introduced behold. The first time he used the word behold, he said behold, and this is Hena, and this is really important. He used it twice. We've never seen this word before. Behold, you can, you, just when somebody says it, you go, whoa, something's up, right? Behold! I am very, whoa. Behold. Behold was used, the first time it was used, it was directed to more, more towards mankind because the word you is second pl 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 plural. It's a second plural. In verses 29 30, it teaches the doctrine of logistical grace. In this, it, 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 then in verses 29 through 30, God was teaching the doctrinal principle that taught Paul, well, Paul learned in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and that is God's grace is always sufficient for every need. Right? God, now listen, that God, will, God will not only take care of your food, he'll take care of your life, right? I mean, that was a point. The birds don't have to do this, they don't do that, they don't have to do this, they don't do that. that. And, and even though man has to do all these things, the same principle applies to both of them. God takes care of you, right? Yeah, the birds, they don't do this, they don't do that, but man does. What's the common denominator then? God takes care of them both. Would you agree with that? That was the principle of Matthew? Yeah, sure it was. That was the principle. My grace, Paul said, God taught me, you know, in his sickness that he had, he said, my, God taught me that his grace is sufficient for powers perfected in weakness, most gladly, therefore, would I rather boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. And so what he's talking about here is logistical grace that's extended to mankind. God will take care of your needs. Not your what? Not your wants. But he will take care of your needs. You should pay attention. There's a little passage on here, Philippians 4. You in your spare time should read that because this is the secret over anxiety in your life. You should read that. Somewhere on your paper, it's Ephesians, the fourth chapter 19, thereabout. God saw, God saw in verse 31, it says, God saw and then gives a second behold. Did you notice that? Look at verse 31. And God saw all, all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. I mean, this is the first time I've ever seen God kind of brag on himself. I mean, he stood back and he looked at it. He went like, I did pretty good. In fact, I did very good. <laughs> you know who he's talking about? He's talking about you and me. He's talking about mankind. And how well he had designed a plan to take care of your every need every day. He is a magnificent God and, and, and worthy to be praised. And do you know that? Are you thankful every day to God that he's given you that day and everything in it? I mean, can you claim Romans 8, 28, for God works everything in my life for good? Huh? Even though it didn't turn out the way you had thought it should have been? How about that? I mean, can you fold your arms over your chest at the end of the day and look at your day and go like, is good? Can you say it's very good? Hmm? Should be able to, shouldn't you? All things work together for good. 
At the end of that day, you ought to be a far, fold your hands over there and you ought to look at that day and go, well, I gave it the best shot I had. And I want to thank you, God, for using me in it, allowing me to be a participant in it. And I thank you for everything I got. I may have not carried the water far enough, but I carried the water. And tomorrow will be a brand new day with brand new things, and I'm, I'm excited to find it. How sad it is for me to find people who hate the thought of tomorrow. I hate the thought of shutting my eyes tonight because of the stuff I got to deal with tomorrow. That's not a part of God's program, I can tell you that. Well, I gave you a few other things to look at. Well worth your time, I can tell you. When I come back next week, we'll talk a little bit more. I want to talk next week to you about Salim DeMuth. I've introduced an idea to you. you you've probably, maybe, maybe some of you have never heard the idea, but made in the image according to the likeness of God. What does that actually mean? What does that actually mean? And how does that benefit me? How, how does that? And if that's true, why do I need to be saved? If it's true that I've been created the image according to the likeness of God, it is. Then why do I need to be saved? And what have, have I lost something? And if I have, well, how will I ever get it back? Well, next week, I'll explain all that. All right? I'll explain every bit of it. Let's have a word of prayer. The men will take the offering. If you're a visitor, this, this meal that we're eating today has been paid for. And this is for the people that know this is their place of worship to contribute. And we don't ask a visitor to do that unless you're motivated. We don't. We, we certainly don't ask you to pay your way through here. So this is our, our privilege. Our people have tried to make it as convenient for you to come and study with us as, as earthly possible. So our Heavenly Father, we thank you today. Uh, a really heavy day on day six. I mean, a heavy day. And there's so much information in it, Father. We don't want to rush our way through it and not, not understand anything. Let's take our time and walk through it and understand a few things that would be important and relevant to our life. Like today, we've learned that not only did God prepare the earth for the habitation of man, but he, he created the things on it and with it to supply all of our needs. What a wonderful passage that Paul caught the gist of that in Philippians 4. In that fourth chapter, he just captured that idea. And he talks about logistical grace. And Jesus talked about it in Matthew 6 and again in Matthew 10. And told us to take a look at the birds and take a look at the animals around you. Are you not worth more than they? I'm afraid, Father, that somehow we've lost our way as humans and as the church to sometimes think that maybe there is something of more value than ourselves. The truth of the matter is, it's the soul made in the image according to the likeness of God that has made us worth the cross of Jesus Christ. May we be thankful for that. If there are those here today, Father, that don't understand the simplicity of the gospel, it is that Christ died for our sins personally, our personal sins. And we personally must believe that he was buried and raised from the dead to give us life everlasting. When we believe it, we receive it. And how do we know it? Because John recorded in the last chapter verse, these things have been written that you may know that you have eternal life. We know because God promised it to us 
And we believe he's a promise keeper. In Jesus' name, amen.